All right, we're back to gate today with our second reading of our continued story, The Midwife's Apprentice. We are on chapter six, and yesterday we talked and learned about um, protagonist and who the protagonist is in our story. And if you don't already know, it's our character, um, Brat, who wish name has been changed to Beetle, and now it's been changed to Alice. So same character, same protagonist, just different names. And yesterday we talked about conflict and the resolution. So um, the conflict is kind of building in our story as we continue on. So I want you to think of what's building up to the main conflict, the main climax of what the fight's going to be and how it gets resolved. Where each day, each chapter as we're reading, we're getting more and more information. So again, please follow along as I read. I am on chapter six, page 33, the naming. <clears throat> The midwife had lost another tooth and was hobbling about on her broken ankle, throwing copper pots and cooking spoons about the cottage in her anger at age and teeth and life. Get out of my sight, dun beetle, before I squash you. Alice. What'd you call me? Not you. Me. Alice. My name is Alice. Alice. <laughs> the midwife snortled, like Walter Smith's great black horse, Toby. Alice, you won't more, look more like a toad or a weasel or a mud hen than an Alice. And, and as she punctuated each name with another pot thrown in the girl's direction, Beetle thought to go out. Out was no punishment. Out was where there were no kettles to stir, no bottles to fill, no smoky cooking fire. Out was where the air was cool this summer morning, although the sun was warm. Out was where Beetle had spent most of her life. Out was where the cat was. She wanted to tell him about her new name, Alice. She had not dared yet say it aloud, but now that she had said it to the midwife, she wanted to tell everyone. Alice, she said to the cat, who rubbed and purred against her ankle, I have a new name now, cat, and you must also, so I can call you to breakfast on cold, foggy mornings. I will say some names, and you will tell me when I have found the right one. Beetle sat on the ground, dusty ground, legs crossed. The cat stared and sat and stared at her. Willow, she asked. Purslane. Gypsy moth. Lentil. The cat just stared. Beetle stood and walked towards the river, one hand across her belly, the other stuck in her mouth. Beetle was thinking. Irony. Millstone. Fleecy. Gone. Completely daft, heavy Beetle, said the miller as he passed. Alice, said Beetle. Alice who? Who Alice? I am Alice, Beetle said. Not Brat or Dung Beetle or Beetle. Alice. Bah, said the miller. Might as well call a rock Alice or a sheep Alice. Bah. Earth pine, continued Beetle to the cat. Dartmoor. Cheesemaker. Holly. Pork. Who you calling pork, you whiffle brain dung beetle? This from the blacksmith's late lardy daughter, Gromit. The cat, Beetle said, and I am Alice. You are a nitwit, Gromit Smith replied and laughed as she waddled away. Beetle sighed. This business of having a name was harder than it seemed. A name was of little use if no one would call you by it. The cat wound himself around Beetle's ankle and purred. Columbine. Cuttlefish. Purr, the cat responded. Clatweed. Shovertail. Wimble. Purr, the cat responded. Horse it. Purr, the cat demanded. Purr, Beetle asked. Purr, the cat responded. And that was that. While Beetle and Purr walked in the sunshine, waiting for the midwife's temper to cool enough to, for them to beg bread and cheese and an onion or two, the villagers brought in the last shave, sheaves from the field and hay harvest over, sat down to eat and drink and give thanks that the rain had held off. Several of the village boys with too much ale and too few wits left to the celebration looking for trouble to cause, and they found Beetle. Dung Beetle, give me a kiss, called the boy with red hair. Alice, whispered Beetle, surrounded by boys and abandoned by the cat. She calls you Alice, Will, thinks you're a girl or a fine lady down from the manor. Your friends were with the Dung Beetle, Lady Alice. The boy with the broken teeth looked, although all another pulled from his mug of ale and spat at Will. Beetle took advantage of Will's distraction to duck beneath his arm, loop her skirts between her legs, and take off down the road to the river. The boys were faster, but they were drunk. And Beetle reached the river before they did. She looked for safety. An open field to lay, field lay to her right. They could catch her there. They were not that drunk. 
Straight ahead was the river, but she could not swim. No one could. Water was for horses to drink and an occasional quick bath before weddings and such. A sudden breeze rustled the, the leaves of a willow and it was as it was as if it were calling to beetle. Up she climbed into the branches, treed like a fox, waiting for what would happen next. Pushing and shoving each other, the boys encircled the tree. Dung beetle, dung beetle, you must be afeard so far from your dung, they chanted. Come down and we'll take you home and lay you softly in the dung heap, deep, deep, deep into the dung heap. More ales swigging and chanting and pushing and shoving. Suddenly the boy with red hair lost his footing on a slippery bank and tumbled into the churning river. Gorm, Will, get out of there, said Snaggletooth Jack. Can't, said Will, spitting water and floundering. Throw me something to grab. But the water pulled Will under for a moment, and the boys, growing sober and scared, knocked one another aside in their attempts to get out of there to a place that they could claim they had never left when poor Will's drowned body was found. So that when Will surfaced again, still spitting and floundering, no one was there but Beetle in the tree. Looking down at him with her eyes great and her white face, Beetle, help me, throw me something. Beetle shook her head. I'd be too scared. He disappeared again, and Beetle crept carefully out, out on an overhanging branch to see where he had gone. Sputtering, he up came, too full of water to call her name or beg for help, only looking at her in his, as his arms slapped the water around him. Beetle crept further out on the branch. It dipped towards the river, very slowly, inch by inch, as the boy struggled not to sink. She crept out into the tip of the branch, nearly touched the water. Grab it, Will, she said. And he grabbed it. Slowly, slowly, he pulled himself along the branch until, from all his pulling and Beetle's weight, it cracked, and they both fell in the riverbank. Mm. Will lay there mm. while Beetle watched to see what he, whether he was alive or dead. Then he spat water all over his shirt, and she knew he lived to be devil her once again. You didn't run with the others, he said. That were brave, Beetle. Nah, I'd be not brave, she said. I near pissed myself. I did it for you, else you've a drowned and gone to hell. A drunken loudmouth bully like you, and I would have helped send you there, and I could not have that now, could I? You have pluck, Beetle. Alice. You have pluck, Alice. They looked at each other, pretended they hadn't, and went home. That night, Beetle had a dream. The Pope came to the village and called her Alice, and the king married the midwife, and the cat laughed. So as we keep reading, thinking of how Alice is growing and changing as, as our story continues. How is she changing from the meek girl who didn't speak anything and didn't do much of anything, just hid from people? And how is she growing and developing into a new person, a stronger person? Be looking for textual evidence as I, we read on. Chapter 7, The Devil. If the world were sweet and fair, Alice, she must be called Alice now, and Will would become friends and the village would applaud her for bravery and the midwife would be more generous with her cheese and onions. Since that is not so, and the world is just as it is and no more, nothing changed. Most of the villagers still paid no attention to Alice at all. Some were mean, like Gromit Smith, near as big as a dozen Alices, who would sit on top of the girls so Jack and Wet could rub chicken anywhere in her hair, or the miller who pinched her rump when she brought grain to the mill to be ground. And some were kind, or nearly so, like the baker's wife, who always asked Alice how she feared on this fine day, and the red-headed Will, who threw fewer stones at her since her saving of him and sometimes stopped the taunting altogether, saying, Bah! This grows, wag grows boresome. Dick's granny is hanging out the wash. Let's go tie knots in her britches. In his britches. And that's the way it was until the day the devil walked about. It started with two-headed calf born to Roger Muster's cow Molly. And then a magpie landed on the miller's barn and would not be chased away. Suddenly the whole village saw witches and devils everywhere and fear lived in every cottage. Alice, who had slept alone outside in the dark for most of her years, even at Fearful times, like All Hallows Eve and Walpurgis's Night, had never yet seen the devil and had nothing to fear from the night. It was then, it was she then, who was sent to fetch and carry and deliver messages after dark while the villagers stayed in their smoky cottages. So it was that she saw much of what went on in the village and how people lived their lives and spent their time. It was so quiet for a few days and with all the villagers inside and idle, that Alice even had a little time to herself to wander and think and plan, 
to watch and learn from Gilbert Grayhead about the carving and polishing of wood and to ask questions of the priests about sin and the devil and evil, humming to herself all the while. Then one damp autumn morning, Robert Weaver found strange footprints which wound about the village and stopped suddenly at the door of the church. He called Thomas at at the bridge, who knew the ways of wood and the tracks of the animals, to help him discover what sort of beast had been prowling about while they slept. Word a weasel, Thomas. No, that's a hoof. A weasel has toes. A goat, Thomas. No, those prints are much too big for a goat. A pig. No, a pig has dew claws like that. A boar, Thomas. With that delicate arch, never a boar, Robert. What then, Thomas, what has hooves is larger than a goat and more delicate than a boar and walks our village by night but stops outside the doors of the church? By dinner time, all of the town was talking about the strange animal that even Thomas at the bridge could not identify. It only took a few incautious words and fearful whispers to convince them that the devil had found their village and was looking for souls to lead into sin. The next day, the strange delicate hoof prints were found walking around Dick's granny's cottage and through the barley field. Robert and Thomas and the priest whispered pastor notes, followed the prints all the way to the mill where, crossing themselves, they unlatched the door. The startled miller looked up, caught in the act of putting some of Danny's, Danny's granny grain into his own sacks. The devil has indeed been here, cried the priest, and he has tempted our miller into theft. But let us deal with all this thief mercifully, for which of us could withstand the devil? The villagers agreed, and so the miller, had, who had listened to the devil, did not have his hands chopped off, but only stood one day in the rain with his millstone tied about his neck. Nice punishment, huh? The next day all was quiet, and it was hoped that the devil had moved on to tempt another village. But as the day passed in the evening, Kate, the weaver's daughter, ran to the priest with her tale of seeing the devil's print leading up to Walter Smith's barn. The priest and the brave band of villagers, armed with rakes and pitchforks and sticks, tied into crosses, hurried into the barn. The priest sprinkled the door with holy water and threw it open. There, cuddled in the hay mound, were Gromit, the smith's lardy daughter, and the pockmarked pig boy from the manor. The boy gathered his breeches and flung himself out the barn window. Gromit, being larger, moved more slowly and was caught. For listening to the devil, Gromit was made to spend the night in prayer and fasting. She wept, though for the loss of pride or loss of supper, none could say. As the villagers sat down to their dinners the next day, what with the runny nose hurried down the road calling, I have seen him, a hairy demon with horns and claws and a great thrashing tail. He's on the road to the manor looking for souls to take to hell. Fully half the villagers ran away from the manor road, but the other half ran towards it, making sure the priest in the holy water preceded them. Preceded means in front. There was no sign of the devil or the manor road or into the woods on e or in the woods on either side. Finally, the villagers start started home, and there near Roger Mustard's cottage were the devil's prints, marching down the road past Dick's granny's cottage, around Walter Smith's barn, and up to the door of William the Reeves' cottage. Again, the villagers flung open the door, and again they found the devil had been at work. For there was Watt finishing off William Reeves' leg of mutton dinner. The priest decided that Walt's gluttony and deceit were the fault of the devil and not of the boy, so Walt's face was not branded. Now, seventh graders, you know what a brand is. For stealing, one of the punishments would be that they would put a hot iron and brand you on your face or another part of your body that was visible so that everyone who'd see you would know that you were a thief and you'd have that brand for the rest of your life. Painful and a constant reminder of, the, of what you had done. The next morning, it was a larger group of villagers who found the, followed the hoof prints to the woods where the broken toothed Jack and his friends were clearing brush from Roger Mustard's field. Likely the devil had tricked the boys into laziness, for they were found asleep and given a sound beating. Two days went by with no sign of the devil. The villagers grew calmer, thinking themselves fortunate not to have tempted, been tempted by the devil, and they found out in so public a fashion. Then, on a miser misty morning, the devil walked to the village again. But this time, no one expected to catch him. 
but they were so eager to see whom they would find and what sin, so all the villagers followed the prince, except for the midwife, who was called to the manor at the last minute, and Alice, who was elsewhere. The parade of villagers laughed and gossiped on the village and all along the old north road. As they followed the prince through the field, they grew quiet. The prince stopped near a large tree and so did the villagers. From behind the tree came the call, Is that you, Jane, my dove? And out leaped the baker holding a bunch of Michaelmas, daisies, and a basket of bread before him. All was quiet. The baker's wife stepped forward and took flowers as the villagers turned and walked away, leaving her to sort out what was the devil's work and what was the baker's. Now remember, who was the baker looking for? If you remember from the previous chapter, he and Jane were having a secret affair, and he's now just been outed to the whole group, including his wife, who's now found out what he's been doing. Continuing on. After the departing villagers passed the river at a spot where the water ran swift and deep, Alice stepped out of the woods. He took something from under her, under her skirt, threw it in the river, and followed the crowd, crowd home. And so it was then, and so it was that all, except the fortunate midwife, who had taunted or tormented Alice, were punished for their secret sin. After this, the devil was never seen in the village again, and no one but Alice knew why. So, seventh graders, you should be thinking to yourself, who's been doing this? Who's played the devil the whole time? And you should know it was Alice. And Alice retaliated to all the people who had been bullying her and torturing her in that town. And she kind of told them all, exposed them all for the sins and the bullies that, that they were. Several days later in the village where the river meets the sea, there washed up on the, bask, on the banks two blocks of wood carved in the shape of hooves of some unknown beast. No one could figure out what they were or where they had come from, so eventually Annie Broadbeam Broad threw them into a cooking fire and enjoyed a hot rabbit stew on a cool autumn night. Chapter 8, The Twins There being few babies born this, that September, Alice and the midwife spent their days making soap and brewing cider and wine. The first occupation stank up the air for miles around, what with goose grease and mutton fat boiling away in the kettle, so that Roger Mustard in the manor fields and the miller at his wheel near the river sniffed the air and said, Somebody be making smoke soap today. The second task would lay perfume on the air and gladden noses near and far. Alice was greatly relieved when enough soap was made to wash all the linen in England, and brewing could begin. First, they cooked parsnips with sugar and spices and yeast and poured this into casks, where the fermenting mixture sang loud and sweet as it turned into wine. And the same day, they did that with turnips. Then Alice, with the baskets tied to each of the pole, walked with the cat to the abbey gardens to gather fallen fruit. There, laying on the ground as if scattered by a god, just for Alice, were apples, red and yellow, large and small, sweet and tart, firm and juicy. She tried a few, but unable to say whether she liked best the crisp white flesh cacodies, the small sour fox whelps, or the mellow sweet rusty coats or, and ruby stripes, she tried a few more. The cat, not finding that apples were good to eat, battered the small ones around in the yard, imagining that they had ears and tails and other parts that made things worth chasing. Returning to the village late in the day with her baskets and belly full of apples, Alice cut through the manor fields near the, where the villagers had dug a pit for the quarrying of gravel. From inside the pit came the cries of some fearful thing, a beast or a witch or a demon, so she crossed herself and hurried her steps. A demon was calling, Come here to me, here to me! Alice ran faster, then stopped. The demon sounded mightily like Will, the boy with the red hair, who used to torment her and now did not so much. Are you a demon or a red-headed lout? She called. Alice, be that you, came the response from the pit. Cautiously, she crept over to the edge and looked over. It was a red-headed lout, and with him his cow. Alice, you must help me. Tansy has fallen into the pit, and I cannot get her to climb out, for she is about to have her cap and will not move. Come and help me. I am no midwife for cows, Will Russet, she called. She needs your help, Alice, and so do I. Indeed, I am no midwife at all, Will Russet, and, and I do not know what to do. Come over and I will tell you. This is Tansy's first calf, but not mine. 
At that, Tansy called out low and mournful and full of fight, of pain and fright. Alice could not bear to leave her like that, so she put down her baskets of apples and slid into the pit. Will grinned at her. Good for you, Alice. Here, hold her head. Keep her quiet. Sing something soft. I do not know any singing, Will Russet. Croon a song without words, then just make sweet noises. So Alice did, although none would have called them sweet, but she and the boy and the cow, and perhaps the cat who lay above where Alice had left him, carefully licking the soft pink pads on his feet. Hold her, Alice, rub her head and belly. If we can be but calm her, God will tell her and the calf what to do. Alice sang and rubbed, calling the cow's sweetheart and good old girl, as she heard Will do, and the boy pushed and pulled and worked as hard as a cow. Several times they near gave up, but Alice always found one more song or one more rub inside her, and Will loved Tansy like she was his babe, his babe and not his cow, and so the tired pair kept on. Finally, as day darkened into evening, there came the feet of a calf, then more feet, and more. Twins, Alice! cried Will. You have brought great luck, for Tansy be having twins. So she was, and two slippery, shiny, brand new calves were laying in the dirt of the pit, and Tansy was licking and nuzzling them gently. Once Alice and Will took the calves upon their shoulders and scrambled from the pit, so too did Tansy, not willing to stay alone in, the, in that hard, dark, and calfless place. Like a holy procession, they returned to the village, the boy and the girl, and the newborn twins, and the cow, and the calf. Will so happy with twice the bounty he expected from Tansy, he made sure to tell everyone of his luck and of the great help Alice had been to him, and Alice felt her skin prickling with delight. Although she got in a muck of trouble for being so long about apple gathering and then losing the baskets as well as the fruit, for in the excitement of the twin calves, they were forgotten and left behind and never seen again. As September turned to October and October to November, through all those days, Alice grew in knowledge and skills. The midwife, busy with her own importance, did not notice. Alice, grown accustomed to herself, did not notice, but the villagers all noticed. And as October turned into November and the ghosts walked on All Hallows' Eve, they began to ask her how and why and what can I? Sometimes for her help or advice, someone would pay her a ribbon or an egg or a loaf of cheese or bread, which she always gave to the midwife, as if Alice herself was just the midwife's hand or arm during the work and receiving the pay, but taking no credit for the task. One morning, as they sat under the old oak tree eating their breakfast bread, Alice told the cat again about the bird of the tansy twins. All shiny they were and sticky to touch. I did not know them, but I loved them so much. This sounded to her like a song, and so she made singing songs as she as she had the day in the gravel pit, and then sang words to the tune. All shiny they were and sticky to touch. I did not even know them, but I loved them so much. And so it was that Alice learned about singing and making songs. Her song brightened the cold gray day, so that the co a cowbird thought it was spring and began to sing in the old oak tree. Chapter 9. The Bailiff's Wife's Baby a good night, a good nut year means a good baby year, the midwife said as she sent Alice and her nutting basket to the woods to see what kind of year it would be. All day, Alice shook the young trees, climbed into the old ones, and gathered the hard shells bounties that fell. Hazelnuts, walnuts, chestnuts, almonds mounded in her basket and stirred her hunger with thoughts of hot roasted nuts on cold winter nights. That was the limit of her imaginings, for she never even heard of almond cream, pickled walnuts, or eels and chestnut sauce, such as they ate at the manor of the homes of the rich merchants in London and York. Coming back from the woods, she saw the boys teasing the cat. She took a handful of nuts, the biggest and the hardest and heaviest in her basket, and heaved them at the boys. Touch that cat again, she shouted, and I will unstop this bottle of rat's blood and viper flesh and summon the devil who will change you into women and henceforth each of you will giggle like a woman and wear dresses like a woman and give birth like a woman. She was too startled by her own outburst to be afraid. The boys were too startled by her outburst to move. And so per the cat escaped and Alice reached the midwife's cottage unharmed. And until they were quite old, the boys in the dark of night sometimes were afraid that the midwife's bottles actually had power to make them into women. It was, a fortunate, it was fortunate that the boys never tasted Alice's, tested Alice's magic. For the bottle that she shook so fiercely at them was not but blackberry cordial. She was to deliver to the old Anna on her way home from nutting in the woods. And although it would have made the boys per 
purple and sticky. No harm would have befallen them and never would they have been able to give birth like a woman. That night, Joan the Bailiff's wife, Joan the Bailiff's wife sent for the midwife. Alice light, lighted Jane's way through the gloomy night with a rushlight that hissed and sputtered in the mist. The midwife chased Joan's husband, her young son, two pigs and a pigeon out of the cottage, bade Alice wait for her in the yard, and slammed the cottage door. Alice dozed there in the wet through the long hours of the night. Shortly after dawn, when the sky turned not rosy and welcoming as it does in the summer, but merely a lighter shade of gray, the midwife kicked her awake, up beetle, and to the cottage for cowslip, mugwort, and pepper. By the 14th holy hel helpers, Joan will have to sneeze this baby out. When Alice returned, the midwife was waiting in the yard, her bottles and herbs and linens neatly packed in the basket. Has Joan then sneezed your baby out already? Alice asked. <laughs> responded the midwife. This child looks never to come out. You go in and wipe Joan's face and I will be back as soon as I can. Lady Agnes at the manor has started her labor and wishes me to attend her. They will pay me in silver and the bailiff in chicken and bones. God and the baby's willing, I will have it all. Alice began to cry. I do not know what to do, Mistress Jane. Do not leave me. Do not leave her. I do not know what to do. Alice was silenced with a sharp slap. Do nothing, you lack with fool, the midwife spat. She will never deliver the baby. It will die unborn, and I will take it dead from her when I return. Let her labor while I go to see Lady Agnes. I will come back, do what must be done, and collect both fees. Alice snuffled into her sleeve, leaving her nose dirty and red and no drier than it was. Do nothing, repeated the midwife. In her state, Joan will not even remember that I left. Do nothing and say nothing. And off the midwife ran up to the manor where the warm fires blazed and the laboring mothers was soothed with wine and syrups and kind words. Alice turned back to the dark, cold, nearly empty cottage, took a deep breath and went in. She couldn't see the figures on the bed at first for all the smoke and then realized that the writhing mound was Joan, the bailiff's proud wife, who washed her linens each week and never let herself be seen without shoes, even in the summer. And there she was, a moaning, mewling mound on a straw bed. Alice covered her mouth and her eyes and turned to go. She could tell the midwife she had waited with Joan. Who was to know if she sat on the stoop until she heard the crinkle of the midwife's starched wimple? Let me die by the bones of Saint Mildred. Let me die or help me to die. The moaning, mewling mound spoke not as Alice expected, frantically or madly, but calmly and reasonably asking for death. To Alice, it sounded all the more frightening and strange as if a goose had spoken or an egg or the dung heap in the yard. Beetle, is that you? Joan asked. Where is the midwife? Oh, but to relieve herself, mistress, she will be back soon, and then your babe will be born. Don't shame me, Beetle. I know this babe is stuck and will never be born, and we will both die soon, and why not now? Surely the midwife has something in her basket to help us along. Shh, mistress. Tis but pain and fright make you speak so, for else you'd never think of sending yourself to hell and the baby with you. Hell indeed, Beetle, and no worse than the suffering. Suddenly the proud, reasonable Joan became again the moaning, mewing mound, and then as the hot pains invaded her body, she shouted and thrashed and failed, shrieking and kicking. Alice betook herself to the cottage door, ready to run from the horror, but the memory of the proud, frightened Joan of a moment ago kept her inside. She asked herself, what would the midwife do if she were here? What had Alice seen her do from the cottage windows all this year when the babe would not come and the mother looked to scream and thrash herself to death? What had Will done in the gravel pit to help Tansy with the calves who would not be born? Alice took another deep breath and returned back to jo Joan's side. She gave her mugwort and warm ale to drink and spoke soothingly, calling her sweetheart and good old girl. She warmed oil over the fire and rubbed her head and belly as she had the cows. She did not know the spells or the magic, so Joan gave all the care of and courtesy and hard work. So it was in the middle of the night when the monks were rising from their beds for midnight prayers, and when the town revelers were returning home full of beer and wine, and at the manor, the midwife was delivering Lady Agnes of her first son. So it was that a calmer, more rested Joan, with the kind of attention of the midwife's apprentice, brought forth a daughter, feet first, but perfectly formed, who she called Alice Little.
Alice had washed little Alice little and wrapped her in clean linen and laid her in her father's arms before Jane the midwife bustled up the path and into the cottage. Jane made some remarks which no one believed about having left for just an instant and stuck her head out for and stuck her hand out for her fee. The bailiff said, we have no need of you, Jane. Your helper has taken care of us with her strong hands and her good common sense. After that, Alice felt so much pride and satisfaction that she had to let them let them out somehow. And so she smiled, which felt so good that she thought she might do it again. Facing the midwife's jealous anger, she went back to their cottage, ate some cold soup and hard bread, lay down on her straw mat by the fire, and had a dream about her mother, which upon wakening, she could not remember. So readers, right now you should be thinking, wow, this chapter and what she just did for the bailiff's wife and birth and bringing a baby in that the midwife herself said the mother and the baby were going to die. And she wasn't going to be waste, waste any more time with this, this wife, this woman having this baby. She survived and the baby, she helped the baby be born. And the baby came feet first, which is called um, a breach. No, feet first is not breach. That's um, breach. But having your feet come first is not a good way to deliver a baby. And typically during that time, most of those babies, like, like um, the midwife thought, was going to die. So. Alice saved them both. How do you think the midwife is going to treat her now? We'll see. We'll keep reading one more chapter. The Boy, Chapter 10. After this, when the midwife was summoned to attend a mother, Alice took to stealing her way inside the woman's cottage, hiding in the shadows so not to be noticed, watching closely to see what the midwife did and how and why. She took and stored in her brain and her heart what she heard the midwife say and do about babies and birthing and easing pain. She discovered that an eggshell full of the juice of leeks and mallows would will make a labor quicker, that rubbing the mother's belly with the blood of a crane can make it easier, that birth wort roots and flowers can strengthen contractions in a reluctant mother, and that if all else fails, the midwife can shout into the birth passage, Infant, come forward. Christ calls you to the light. She found the mouse ears and willow can help stop bleeding and that a tea of anise and dill and bitter milkwort will help when milk will not come. She learned that newborn infants are readily seized by fairies unless salt is put in their mouths and their cradles, that a baby born in the morning will never see ghosts, and then a son born after the death of his father will be able to cure fevers. Alice thought the midwives had more skill with herbs and syrups and spells than Will Russet, but Will delivered babies just as well and was much kinder to the mo mothers. Alice thought if she needed a midwife, she'd rather have someone like Will than Jane Sharp for all her spells and syrups. Early one cold November morning, before the pale, watery sun could light up this morning sky, Alice left the midwife's cottage and hurried to the cow shed to see Tansy's twins, now called Belred and Billforth after the saintly local hermits and give and give them some parsnip tops to munch. There huddled as close to Tansy as her calves lay a sleeping boy, blue in his lips, frost in his hair, and tears frozen on his dirt, thin, dirty cheeks. Her coming startled him awake, and he jumped to his feet. Uh, I'll be leaving, mistress, he said. I took nothing. I hurt nothing. I'll be going. Alice grabbed his arm. Wait, boy, I mean you don't know harm. Who are you? I be nobody, mistress. I, I go. Everybody is somebody, and so are you. Do you want some breakfast? From the sleeve of her gown, Alice pulled the parsnip tops meant for the cows and some cheese she had saved for the cat, and fed instantly, the, instead, the hungry boy. She watched him as, she, as he ate. Six, he was. Maybe a year older, for he was so small and thin. He looked a little like her, now that she thought about it. A sudden pleasure inside her warmed her hands as she reached out to smooth the boy's hair. Next time you'll be much warmer nestled inside the dung heap on these cold days, she told them. I know. He finished the cheese and looked up at her. Bread? Bread? I'll go fetch some. You stay here. Alice ran for the cottage, found a bit of bread she had hidden away for the cat, ignored the midwife's questions and demands, and started back for the cow shed. The boy was running down the road towards her, pursued by several much bigger boys shouting and threatening with their pitchforks and rake. Beggar! Thief! Ragtag! They shouted as the boy crushed, crashed right into Alice and sent them both sprawling to the ground. Have off, Dick! 
said Alice, or I'll be telling your granny who drank that ale she hid for herself. And you, Jack Snaggletooth, I'll still have that bottle of rat's blood. As the boys backed away, Alice stood brushing the mud from her skirt with one hand and holding on to the boy with the other. Have off, I said. She repeated, moving towards them. Carpus bones, beetle. We were just but wagging him since you are no sport no more. And the boys moved off to torment someone else until they were found, slapped, and sent back to work. When Alice and the boy, who said his name was Runt, got back to the midwife's cottage, Jane was out seeing to Kate, the weaver's daughter, who was having trouble with her milk. Alice brought the boy into the yard, cleaned his face with her skirt, and combed the straw from his hair, all while telling him that Runt might be a good name for a small pig, but never such a, a likely, likely help looking boy as he, and she would help him find a place to sleep and something, something regular to eat, but he would have to have a real name, for she was not taking any, anyone anywhere named Runt. Which is your name, the boy asked. Alice, said Alice. Then I be Alice too. You can't be Alice, for it's the name for a girl. What then is the king's name? Alice did not know, so she hid the boy in the chicken house and went to the village asking folks what the king's name was. Longshank, said the baker. Hammer, said Thomas at the bridge. The devil himself, said Brian Taylor, who was a Scot, and still had no reason to feel that way. Just the king is all, said several. Edward, said the bailiff. The king's name is Edward. Edward said Alice to the boy. Then Edward be my name, said Edward, who used to be called Runt. Alice nodded. She could see the midwife coming in the distance, so Alice spat on her fingers and rubbed a bit of the stubborn dirt off of Edward's cheek. Go, she said, up that road to the manor. They are hiring boys to help with the thrashing. Tell them Jane the midwife sent you and bid them remember the good job she did delivering Lady Agnes's stubborn son. Now go. Edward shook his head and grabbed a piece of her skirt in his fist, but she put him off, and she straightened his tunic, and he went, looking back once to throw a brave, shaky grin at Alice. The returning midwife, angry at Alice for ignoring her earlier, sent her to do all of the least pleasant chores, roasting the frog livers, boiling snails into jelly, stripping the thorns from dogberry bushes. But Alice minded little for she thought not of her task, but of Edward's face and the abundance of bread and cheese up at the manor looking for a hungry little boy's belly to fill. So if you can think back, think back to why um, Alice's motivation for how she treated Runt, who she renamed. So think of back to her experiences when she was first met by Jane. Did Jane do the, any of the same things for, for um, Alice at the time? Absolutely not. So this kind of gives us some insight into our character, our protagonist, a little bit more into her personality. She's a very solid, smart, caring person. And even though people have been mean to her all of her life, she takes every opportunity to be nice to somebody. And she immediately looks at Runt and thinks of, of herself and remembers of the time when she was in the exact same spot. So she extends her help to him. And we will be done with the reading for the day. Thank you.